Next speaker, we, I've personally been waiting for this speech for a very long time. We were very excited when we confirmed that he's coming. And it was very important for our conference that he will be here. This person knows a lot about building companies, about building successful companies, about working with big names. It is Justin Waldron, some, one of the co-founders of Zynga. He's also uh, well known for creating the Zynga Poker uh, within Zynga. So Justin, welcome up on stage. Very happy to have you here. Welcome to Finland. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed the couple of hours that you've already been here. Thanks. So the stage is yours. Last year, uh, I left Zynga. Ever since then, a lot of people have been asking me what I've been working on. I tell them I'm spending my time traveling, investing, and advising companies. That's a Silicon Valley way of saying I'm temporarily retired. I'm always surprised when they ask me what I'll work on next. How can I know what company I would start a year from now? The best opportunities today won't be the best opportunities in a year. I can only tell you the type of company I would start today. That's what this presentation's about, the death of the App Store. I know what you're thinking. Apple and Google had 100 billion app downloads last year and tens of billions in app revenues. How can the app stores be dying? Things that used to work don't work anymore. Industry leaders are plateauing and declining without explanation. It seems like there are fewer and fewer new success stories every day. But some companies are starting to grow by doing things differently. They're taking advantage of a platform transition Platform transitions are inevitable. They're mysterious, they're obvious in hindsight, but impossibly difficult to predict in advance. They're cherished by small companies and feared by market leaders. Platform transitions can't be ignored. They are the best moments of opportunity for a new company to become an industry leader. Platform transitions create huge companies. These companies are the ones who took advantage of the platform early on. They become experts of the space, they lock in unfair advantages, and they win the land grab. Platform transitions destroy market leaders who don't adapt. These opportunities sometimes start too small for a big company, but grow into something that threatens their entire business. Sometimes they threaten an entire industry. Platform transitions shift power and control. The rules of building, distributing, and monetizing are being rewritten. New companies will decide who is king and who is not. And I believe that a platform transition is happening right now. But before I talk about that, let's take a quick look at some recent ones. In 2004, Gmail launched. It raised the bar for web apps. It was followed by countless others that replaced most major functions of the desktop operating system. Microsoft went from monopolistic behemoth to having barely any power at all. New distribution channels like search engine optimization, Google AdWords, email marketing, and embeddable widgets leveled the playing field. But these services were missing something, an identity, a real identity, something to tell the world who we are and to connect us with the people who matter most to us. The social graph spread quickly and thoroughly. Every type of app was reimagined with social in mind. Word of mouth distribution and social collaboration flourished. Facebook layered on top of the open web and put itself in the position of power. But we were still anchored to our desks. Then smartphones brought the internet into the palm of our hands, creating an untethered world. The app stores have delivered hundreds of billions of downloads but the app store is starting to be disrupted. I'm not talking about the Oculus Rift, wearables, or some other shiny new platform. I'm talking about something that almost everyone in this room already uses. 
it snuck its way into your daily life, and it made itself one of the most important parts of your mobile experience. It's the indisputable killer app for smartphones. Flappy Bird. Yeah. Actually, messenger apps. Messenger app platforms. Like social apps layered on top of the web, messenger apps have layered on top of the mobile app stores. They have already become one of the biggest drivers of installs on mobile. How have the messenger apps been able to launch such powerful platforms? Despite its huge success, the app store has had some problems that have grown worse over time. Early on, a limited amount of apps and developers shared the wealth of new users with the explosive growth of smartphones. But now, with too many apps, users are having trouble finding the sig signal through the noise. The App Store is non-scalable. The App Store is just like Yahoo's directory of websites in the 90s. It works great when there are a few listings, but breaks completely at scale. Like Google and Facebook rendered web directories obsolete. Messengers are redefining app discovery. The average app in the iOS App Store gets 40,000 installs. According to Apple, an install generates 10 cents of revenue on iOS. So the average app earns about $4,000 in its lifetime. As low as this number is, it paints an even better picture than reality. Most of the revenue and installs on the platform go to just a few of the top apps. So the real number of installs and revenue per app is actually far, far lower. Unreliable quality. Users are frustrated by App Store quality. Developers game the review system, and positive ratings can't be trusted. Great apps languish without any way to draw attention to themselves. Users have learned that most apps they download will suck. You're not just paying a dollar for a paid app. You're paying a dollar five times for five different apps until you finally get the app that does what you want. Developers often complain that people will spend five dollars on a cup of coffee but not on a great app. At least when you buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, you know what you're getting. With the App Store, you never know what you're going to get before paying or before downloading. This is exactly why the app install pages convert so poorly. More than 90% of users drop off app install pages without downloading or opening an app. They check out the screenshots. They change their mind. They lose their connection during a long download. Nine out of 10 users interested in your app will never actually even use it. And costs are soaring. Because of the non-scalable discovery and unreliable quality in the App Store, most developers are forced to resort to paid acquisition for growth. But with the soaring cost of installs, most just can't afford it. Cost per install on iOS has risen from $1.30 average in 2012 to over $5 today, depending on the category of the application. That means the average install costs 50 times more than the revenue it generates. Only the apps with the highest lifetime value can survive. And not all of us are as lucky as Supercell. Most types of apps simply can't monetize well enough to buy installs at these costs. So how are messenger platforms redefining discovery? Messenger platforms are scalable. Messenger platforms create scalable, reliable, and effective app discovery via the message channel. This enables the same massive viral growth for mobile apps that Facebook did for web apps. Users can share the best apps with their friends at the click of a button. Messenger platforms have driven 2 billion installs of apps so far. They have quickly become the single biggest driver of app installs in the world, and definitely the cheapest. Apps on Messenger platforms average over a million installs, more than 30 times that of normal apps in the App Store. And Messenger apps drove over well, well over 3 billion in sales last year. That's over 10% of all App Store revenues in 2013. Messengers have huge, diverse, and global audiences. 55% of all smartphone owners use at least one Messenger app. In some countries, over 90% of all smartphone owners use Messenger. Messengers are the highest engagement apps on mobile. Messenger apps are expected to account for 75% of all mobile messages sent in 2018. They have already passed SMS and email and are on track to double this year. The average user uses their phone to check a Messenger app 23 times per day. As Messenger platforms continue to become the dominant app distribution channel over time, only time will tell if the app stores survive. And that's it, so we can do a couple questions now. Thanks, Justin. Thanks. We have quite a bit of time. Should we sit down then? Sure. It's going to be a bit more yeah. comfortable then. That was exciting, you know. Um, 
to, to, to hear somebody talking about the death of the App Store when, you know, everybody's hyping how, how big and exciting that is. And, they, you know, probably a lot of developers here are just hoping to become billionaires off of, mm -hmm. off of the App Store. So, with, with what are you saying, you know, the Messenger apps, how do you think, what will it, you know, come down to? What it will diverge towards uh, within the Messenger app? Or will it completely change once again? Well, it's, when I say the death of the App Store, I mean the App Store's relevance in distributing mobile content. So I think uh, many of us see mobile as a very long-term trend, and I agree with that. Uh, but I think the App Store had a lot of influence and distribution early in the platform, uh, but it's, it's going to get smaller and smaller over time after paid acquisition messengers and other means end up being the majority of distribution. And so I think that messengers will actually be, end up being you know, 80 or 90% of app distribution in a few years um, as the App Store becomes smaller. Do you think that something will replace the App Store for, you know, for all the other side of things? Well, maybe, because the most powerful thing that a platform can do is distribute. So if distribution continues to grow on messengers, it begs the question why the messengers wouldn't completely displace Apple and, other, and Google and other places. Yeah. And so um, obviously the rules right now are constrained what they can do on the platforms, but I think there are many, many big companies in the messaging space, you know, five or six globally that are really, really huge. And all of them have platforms or planned platforms. And um, Apple and Google may be unable to stop some changes from happening gradually. Right. So you think that basically there's a chance that we will see base the App Store in some shape or form through the messaging platforms? I think. I think the App Store will become increasingly irrelevant over time as users find apps in other places. They may be downloading through the App Store, but that doesn't actually um, mean Apple or Google has much control over what gets downloaded and what doesn't. Yeah. Cool. All right. But can I ask you also some questions in general? Yeah. That I mean, is it your first time here in Finland? Yeah. OK. How do you like it so far? I love it. You love it? Uh, yeah. Which part? Sun sets at 10.30. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How about the people? Have you met any people here? What do you think about that in general? Everyone's been great so far, yeah. And um, I've met a, a couple interesting entrepreneurs already. I mean, I was excited to come here because, you know, I'm obviously a huge fan of games, and this is uh, probably the most interesting place in the world right now for games, in my opinion. Um, cool. That's so. cool to hear you say that. And. With, with, with that in mind, do you have any kind of goals? Do you want to meet uh, some entrepreneurs or some type of companies in particular here in Finland? I mean, I'd love to meet startups, and uh, especially if you're working on something like this, you know, something to do with messengers, that's very interesting to me. Because, um, you know, I'm not quite ready to build a company again yet, but uh, if I'd love to work with people who are who are doing something like that. It really interests me right now. But in general, any social startups uh, are interesting to me. So post Zynga, did you start kind of investing more in startups and trying to work more, uh, building a portfolio of startups? Is that kind of one of the things at least that you're taking some time on or? Yeah, I'm, I, I spent about five months in San Francisco after I left Zynga. So those, I was working full time on investing for those five months. Made two or three investments in that time, and I'm probably going to make, you know, four investments, a, four or five investments a year um, at the seed, seed stage. Well, hopefully you'll find some here in Finland then. Yeah, I hope so. Okay, guys, did you hear that? Justin wants to invest into startups that are located in Finland. So <laughs> hopefully, I'm, hopefully I didn't make your way out much more difficult now uh, because startups and entrepreneurs will try to you know, grab you there. But uh, I hope you will find something interesting there. I hope you'll participate in some of the sessions as well. But tell me, can you tell me some you know, story about the Zynga times? I mean, Zynga has gone through a lot of you know, ups and downs and it was uh, a very exciting time. And uh, you know, what is the most memorable moment for you during the Zynga times? I really think people they sometimes start to think too big too early. So when Zynga started, it was really just, uh, it was a poker game on Facebook. And college kids, 
used Facebook. They were 90% of Facebook. And we felt that college kids love poker. At the time, World Series of Poker was on TV all the time. And so we decided to build a poker game for, for Facebook. And then it turned out we realized that we could do a lot more games in that format. But I couldn't tell you bef before our first game that we would know that we were going to build many more. So uh, I don't know. I think the best times I look back on are probably realizing that we built this game and that this game was an indication of something, a vacuum, that we had discovered this, this huge thing. And this was going to apply to every type of game. Um, and we were the only people that knew it at the time. And that was exciting because then it was just a race. So. Yeah. And I mean, but then, you know, at the end, what made you kind of think about, you know, basically stepping out of the game and doing something else uh, instead? <laughs> I mean, I'd been there f for seven years, so I was just kind of ready to, to do something new. Um, and I think, you know, it's a really great company. It's an interesting time to be a game company. Uh, but I, I like to keep learning. And, you know, I, f I feel like things like that are more interesting, newer opportunities, um, sort of things that are changing fast, things I can discover and, and learn a lot about what's next. Uh, it's more easy to do on my own when I'm investing. I'm seeing more companies and uh, there's more, more new opportunities I'm in touch with, I think. Okay, cool. And, but tell us a bit more about, you know, uh, you were talking about platforms, mm -hmm. and we were mainly talking about, you know, mobile, mobile platforms. But what do you think about the way the things are going in general? You know, we had the huge app revolution and the, ho the whole thing with the iPhone. What do you think might be the next steps? I mean, personally, you know, looking like Internet of Things and 3D printing, what do you think will be like the next thing I think messenger platforms are the next thing. That's why, that's, that's why I did this. Um, the reason I love it, though, is because there's... So Facebook was on top of the web, which was already huge. And then they captured the audience, and then they enabled this layer on top of it very quickly. And so the audiences were huge immediately. Um, and that's the same thing that's happening with messengers. So they already have the audience, and now they're letting everybody else have access to it. And so... You know, you can bet on virtual reality and you can bet on other upcoming platforms like wearables, but the market size is really small right now. So what excites me about messengers is that tomorrow there's going to be big, there already are companies who are making a lot of money on messengers. Um, in terms of what's next, I, I have one startup I invested in in San Francisco I think is really interesting. Is uh, It's a food startup and there are a lot of them, but it's, it's delivery of food. Uh, within five minutes. You hit a button on your phone and you get food within five minutes. And so there are a whole bunch of interesting, you know, operational things they had to solve to do that. And I think that that's just, I think that's a really, really interesting space. Oh, I mean, I think you're the first person who explained to me and hopefully the rest of the audience why the hell Facebook bought WhatsApp, you know, <laughs> for that valuation considering the future that you're predicting. So uh, I don't think uh, any other explanation made as much sense. <laughs> so thank you for that. And, but do you think like, that basically what you're saying is that with this, I mean, unless Facebook bought WhatsApp, then somebody could overtake Facebook and it could all kind of move towards messaging. Yeah, I think they've been, Facebook has been really great at, at buying companies to stay, to stay relevant and, and where users are moving toward. Um, WhatsApp actually is one of the only messengers that doesn't have a, a platform right now that is a big messenger. But obviously they're the biggest uh, outside of China. So when they do release something, which it seems like they would if they have to justify that price tag, um, it'll be a huge, huge platform. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I think that's all the questions I have. But I think we have many questions in the audience. Uh, so, uh, yeah, guys, do you have any questions for Justin? There's a couple over here. Could you share what's the most uh, impressive experience to be an entrepreneur chief? I think secrets. Like, I, I think secrets are the, are the most interesting part of, of building a great company. Every great company has secrets. Um, and I know 
Supercell has secrets and Zynga has secrets, and you can analyze the companies, but they know and they, they figure out things that really drive growth. And so like, the pursuit of finding those is the most exciting thing to me, because that's, that's what makes a company succeed. Yeah, so my question to Justin is, um, I mean, how do you see other categories of applications working inside messenger applications? I just don't get it. Like, how would uh, health apps, for instance, or in, uh, sport and fitness applications, for instance, how would they work without the app store? Like, what's the future? That's the first question. So I actually think it's very similar to when mobile first came out. Uh, we're seeing a lot of apps that are porting to the, to the messengers, and they're not particularly good. So um, I actually think this is a huge, huge topic that people need to understand. Um, if you bring your mobile-first design app to a messenger without changing the design, it will fail. I mean, failing on a messenger is going to get you a lot more installs than if you fail on the App Store today, but you're not going to have a, an outsized success. And so I think that the successful apps on messengers are designed to be a part of the conversation. Um, they really they fit in a chat just like a sticker fits in a chat. Uh, we're seeing a lot of really lightweight stuff that even if you don't download the app, um, the part that's in the chat is already useful. It proves its value to the user. And, um, and they're even smaller and more lightweight than mobile apps. So if mobile apps take up the time we have, the free time we have, uh, wherever we are, messenger apps take up the free time between messaging. So it's really about seconds. And um, you know, it's going to be different for every single category, but I think those are the principles that, that I would follow. The second question is, like, how important was this kind of event uh, for Zynga when you launched, for instance? I think they were really important. I mean, they were great for recruiting. Um, for getting people to understand what we were doing and, and why, why we were doing it. Um, I, have, I remember in 2008, uh, it was at, I think it was GDC in San Francisco. Um, we ended up buying out a whole restaurant across the street from, from the conference because we knew that no one knew who we were and they wouldn't walk any further than across the street. So the Moscone Center's here, and then Jillian's the restaurant across the street. And then we put out a giant sign that just said free drinks and free food. Um, and not one person that went to the conference knew who we were. Uh, but we used it as a way to launch our platform. Zynga had a platform in 2008. Um, and so <laughs> I, I just thought that that was actually uh, you know, a really interesting time, because we were actually doing pretty well, but social games weren't really a theme or fashionable yet. And so we could afford to rent out the best spot and give away everything for free, but no one really knew who we were yet. So for us, the events were about hiring and, and you know, leveraging it to grow the company. And uh, we were very careful not to really tell everyone um, to join us. So this is the type of talk where, this is the type of talk where I would give it in Zynga. I would say to everybody, like, this is the next interesting opportunity. This isn't the type of talk I would give to everybody if I was working in Zynga, because we don't want to tell everybody to do what we think is interesting, right? So I think that's the other part of, uh, of this that's a little bit different. You said the App Store will wither out and the focus will shift towards messenger apps. But uh, what if the App Stores went through a redesign? What would you define as a good App Store? I think Apple and Google are in a really difficult place to redesign the App Store in the way it needs to happen because of the technology that's behind applications. So I talk about how Google and Facebook replaced Yahoo as a website directory. And I think with apps, to use the Google analogy, I don't think that search within apps is really uh, possible or doable in a nice way uh, as long as they're sort of separate downloadable experiences. And in terms of social discovery, Apple and Google have had a lot of trouble building social channels because they're so focused on building non-operating uh, system agnostic communication channels, right? So Apple has iMessage, but it's not, 
it's not gaining wide usage because, of course, some people use it by mistake. But the reason these Messenger apps are succeeding is because iMessage isn't a good solution. You don't know which friends have iOS. You don't know which friends have Android. I think that's the same reason that Apple has a lot of trouble building an app store that's scalable with social discovery, because social is not something they can really build internally. So maybe they will end up, uh, at some point, leveraging the messengers in a way that makes it part of the App Store. But it's hard to imagine either of them making progress in discovery, social discovery, without first making progress in social. Uh, you talked about the most exciting things. So what was the biggest challenge, and uh, how you overcame it, or biggest struggle in your? Well, <laughs> the biggest challenge was uh, these platform transitions, right? I mean, Zynga had a lot of trouble with mobile, um, but not for lack of trying. So in 2008, we, had, we said, mobile's awesome. Apple opened a platform. This is going to be a big deal. We put 30 people on it. That's probably more than 99% of the mobile companies in 2008 for smartphone. And we were too early. So everything we did was freemium. We wanted free games with paid, uh, you know, paid consumables or whatever else. And Apple didn't even have in-app purchases yet. Apple didn't have in-app purchases for another two years. And so we were selling paid apps so you could get points in Mafia Wars. So you'd end up buying 35 Mafia War apps that all added points. So Zynga was really, really early on mobile. It wasn't, it wasn't that we weren't early. It's that our business model didn't work there. So then we started backing off of it a little bit. Um, and I think we just saw the challenges of, of when you have a lot of revenue coming from one place, how do you focus on something you know is really important, but is really small right now, um, even if you know it's going to be very big tomorrow? So I think it's, it's really hard to, to explain that until you've experienced it, um, because these things are so obvious in hindsight. And you, but um, even when you're a private company, you're so married to revenue that it's, it's incredibly difficult to focus on things that aren't driving big revenue yet. So th that's probably the, the biggest challenge we had. All right. It was well, the same reason, by the way, that while we were going to social games, that Electronic Arts and these big companies would look at us and they would say, those guys, what they're doing doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's not interesting. We're making billions of dollars. That's tens of millions, not interesting. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's just, you know, the cycle that plays its course and it'll happen to some companies with, ever, with whatever's next, so. Cool, well, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I, I, I learned a lot for sure and uh, I'm gonna definitely be th th thinking about this in the future. So, thank you so much. Let's give Justin a cool. woohoo. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.